Praise the Lord. So today we are continuing with our second part of Hebrews chapter 9. And uh, last time we saw the, we went through chapter 9 from verse 1 to 10. So we are continuing from verse 11 up to verse 28. And in the last study we saw the shortcomings of the old covenant where we saw that it was temporary and imperfect and could not cleanse the sins of the people permanently. But also, it was also a point of what was to come. It was pointing towards Christ. So we continue with the second part, which will be from verse 11. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that as we study this portion, you will speak to us. You will remind us of the things that you've always taught us through your word, and you will strengthen us uh, to have faith in you even more. This we pray in Jesus' name. I read through from verse 11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That, that is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the, holy, the most holy place for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself and blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is a mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who makes it is living. This is why even the first covenant had to, was not put into effect without blood. When Moses proclaimed every command of the Lord to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Verse 23. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in, the presen in God's presence, nor did he enter to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that, he, that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. Of many and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. From this portion, we continue with the theme which uh, runs through the book of Hebrews about the priesthood of Christ and Christ being the mediator between God and man. And we see it from uh, verse 11. If you go uh, verse by verse, we see that Christ came as the high priest. And he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. As we saw, the first tabernacle was something that was man-made. It's God who gave the instructions to Moses. He told him what to do, where he was supposed to, uh, how he was supposed to build the tabernacle, the dimensions, what was supposed to be in those places. Nevertheless, it was still a man-made uh, tabernacle. But and we saw the various shortcomings that it had. 
But in this case, we have Christ coming himself as the perfect sacrifice. And uh, when Christ comes, the human limitations that were there in the first covenant are removed. Because in this case, it was Christ himself. It was his own blood and not blood in basins. And he entered heaven in the presence of God, not a copy of what is in heaven. So this was a replacement of what we had initially. Because ideally, it was Christ. Uh, it, it was a priest carrying blood of an animal, going to sacrifice an animal. But in this case, Christ is the one who goes into the tabernacle himself, and not with blood of animals, where a priest would have to go there with a blood in a basin, but it was Christ who carried his own blood, and it is the one that was used. And then it was not the earthly tabernacle as we know, of, as we know in the Old Testament, but he was entering the presence of God signifying a perfect tabernacle. And in verse 12, we see that he did not enter by means of the bloods of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place, thus obtaining eternal redemption. We saw that one of the shortcomings with the old covenant is that it was temporary. It has to be done over and over again. The priest would keep going to offer sacrifices. It didn't matter that you had offered the same sacrifices the last year and the other years or earlier in the year, but over and over again, the same sacrifices had to be offered. And it was using the bloods of goats and calves and sheep the blood of animals. Verse 13, we see that the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially and clean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ? This is a comparison we are seeing between the old covenant and the new covenant. We are coming from a place where it was the blood of sheep and goats and uh, calves to the place where it is the blood of Christ himself. So if the blood of sheep and goats and bulls could uh, cleanse the sins of people outwardly, how much more than should we expect if it is the perfect sacrifice, which is the blood of Christ? This is a comparison uh, we are seeing here. And uh, in verse 14, we see that uh, it was, we are talking about the death of Christ. Because in both covenant, there was death. Blood had to be shed. But in this case, it's the blood of Christ. And when we compare the blood of sheep or the blood of goats and that blood of Christ, we are trying to see an image of a copy of a thing and the real thing. It's the way people hang a portrait of the president in, a, in an office. I don't know, to signify national unity or something like that. And the image itself is a sign of something then what would happen if the president himself walked into that office? Or the way we have images of the place that we would want to go, we have images of uh, exotic destinations that we would want to visit once upon a time in future. Or the image of a car that you would want to purchase one day or that house you'd want to build. If it, the image can owe you, what about the real thing when it is uh, brought to you? What about when you visit that destination or when you build that house that you've always desired. You cannot compare the two. And so this is how superior uh, this new covenant is and what Christ has done for us. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. So this is the good news about uh, receiving Christ, receive, being part of this new covenant. And we see that, uh, same verse 15, that Christ died as a ransom to set them free from sins. The word uh, ransom used here is a technical term that uh, signifies paying uh, for something. The way you have a hostage situation and you need to rescue somebody, you have to pay the ransom that is demanded. And so Christ comes and does the same thing for us. And it's also compared to a will. In the case of a will, 
it is necessary to prove the death of the one who had made it because our will is in force only when someone has died. Never takes effect while the one who made it is living. Uh, in that verse, we see that Christ had to die and uh, we are introduced to the legal aspect of our will. A will is a document that highlights the beneficiaries of uh, someone's death. If someone is to die, the property, what he owned or something, where, would it, where should it go? Who should inherit what he has? And it is different to, from a dying declaration whereby in the will, the people listed are supposed to be the beneficiaries. But there's also another aspect of dying, which is called, uh, I think it's called dying declaration, whereby if someone found me dying somewhere and I told them that it's so and so who killed me, that st statement would be very valid in a court and someone can be prosecuted out of those words. But in the will, it's meant to bring benefit to those who are listed in it. And so in Christ's death, we as human beings are supposed to benefit from what he is leaving behind. He comes and takes away the sins of the world and pays the debt that we owe so that it can be attributed to us. And that is the essence of the new covenant. Everything uh, that Christ did was for us. And death had to take place for our will to be valid. If you found my will today, it wouldn't make sense. You can't claim something because you have seen it in my will. Even if I had listed you for as long as I'm alive, uh, the will can be changed, can be altered. But as long as someone is dead, it is fixed and it's written. So the death of Christ is meant to bring us benefit as believers that instead of regularly going to the tabernacle and offering sacrifices, finding the high priest to offer sacrifice because of the sins that we've done, Christ comes and he offers this sacrifice once and for all so that we can be set free from sin and we can be made right with God. Moving on, in verse 18, uh, we see uh, the mention of the blood. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. And we see the role that blood was playing here. And you may be, you may be tempted to ask, how comes that this covenant, the old and the new one, is about blood? How comes? What, what was the reason? Even in the Bible, uh, Mark chapter 8, I see that when Christ told the disciples that he was going to die, he would be crucified, they did not, they did not like the idea. They were wondering, how comes this man is supposed to be our Messiah and he's saying that he's going to die? Uh, we see that uh, Mark 8, verse 31 to 32 says that he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You see, even Peter d doesn't get this point that Christ was going to die as he establishes new, this new covenant. But remember, we see also in the Bible that the penalty of sin had been set. And this we can see it from uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, which says that the wages of sin is death. As long as there is sin, death will follow because it's a natural consequence of sin. But also in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, we see the same thing. Uh, this is uh, God during the creation talking to Adam. And uh, one thing they are told is that, you, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So this was also another consequence of sin. God saying that as long as you sin, the consequence will be death. Death will follow. So that has, had been said. And it is in the Old uh, Testament we start seeing death of another being offered in substitute for the sinner. Like instead of the one who is sinning dying, something is being offered. And the, it is the animals that are being sacrificed in this case. 
You know, uh, we see in Leviticus 11 verse 17 about the life of an animal being in its blood. Uh, that's Leviticus 17 verse 11. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. That is a reparation for an offense that one does. Blood had to be shed. In this case then, the blood is for the initiation of the new covenant. That's why Christ had to die and had to shed the blood. And was, that was done on our behalf so that we wouldn't have to die because of our sins, but the, our sins, Christ can carry them and we can be set free. Moving on, uh, verse 23, we see that it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. I think we mentioned earlier, uh, it, is, it was mentioned in the earlier chapter that uh, uh, what was there was a copy of, what, of the real thing, of what was in heaven. When we talk about the earthly tabernacle, uh, it's uh, chapter 8, verse 5, says that a copy and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain. This was designed as a copy of what was to come or what was to be presented. And we see that in the first part in chapter 9, verse 1 to 10. We see that uh, the old covenant was also a pointer to what Christ was coming to do. That's why there was strict uh, uh, requirement of how it was to be made because it was uh, something God had planned through time. And we say that we need to look at history as something as God working through time, which we are part of. So through what was done previously, we can understand the new uh, thing that is there. In fact, it's called, it, it talks about establishing a new order. And Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. So this one was made with human hands, but what Christ entered was heaven itself, the real sanctuary to appear in God's presence for us. And this distinguishes the old covenant in the sense that it was man-made and the priest would enter once upon a, once in a once a year, the high priest would enter the holy of holies once a year to offer sacrifice for his own sins and for the sins of the people. But here, it was not a sanctuary made by human hands; it was in the presence of God. And we see uh, in Christ's death, one of the things that is reported is the curtain was torn into two, the curtain of the temple, so that signifying that we were free and we were allowed to enter into the presence of God. So we see uh, towards the end that the heaven sanctuary was the perfect one, and it was the perfect sacrifice once and for all. He has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And uh, in verse 30, we see that uh, Christ will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Uh, the chapter ends with a promise that Christ is coming back for a second time. And this brings hope and helps us also to understand the purpose of this new covenant, that it is not something about uh, that is valid for a lifetime, but it continues over and over when Christ comes a second time. So in summary, what we see in this uh, chapter 9 is that Christ is our high priest. And I'd say that this is the theme that runs through the whole of the book of Hebrews. And we see that he is a sanctuary itself, and like those that are made with human hands, which he entered, which he enters and secures us eternal salvation, which he enters and secures us eternal uh, deliverance. Then we see it's not temporary, it is permanent and it's a perfect sacrifice, establishing a perfect covenant which Christ paid with his own blood. And we see that what was in the Old Testament was a precursor of what was to come. It was uh, pointing to Christ and what he would do for us. And the last thing is that he is 
coming back again. So when we look at the, cove at, uh, the new covenant, it, the old covenant uh, starting from the, uh, with Moses and even earlier times up to now, up to what is to come, we see God at work preparing for the redemption of man at work today, still doing us and delivering us from our sins, but also in the future that Christ will come back again to bring salvation to, that, to those who are waiting for him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and as we continue to enjoy the benefits of the new covenant, we ask that you will help us to be grateful to you and to be filled with gratitude for what you've done for us. Please, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you.